Hi, this is Ray Mosholder. We are back to Chapter 4 of No Surrender by Chris Edmonds and Douglas Century. And this book is dedicated to all veterans of every war and also dedicated to the people who need to understand desperately how much freedom means in any country. Chapter four. And remember that these are Tennesseans. I didn't know that till the third chapter, but I'm gonna give it the Tennessee try. My father was born in late summer 1919 when his hometown of Knoxville was about to erupt in turmoil. Wednesday, August 20th, began bright and unseasonably warm. A severe drop had left the Tennessee River riding low as it slipped south under the Gay Street Bridge. That night, at 20 minutes past eight, Dr. J.J. Eller delivered Roderick Waring Roddy Edmonds the last of four boys, to my grandparents, Thomas and Jenny, at their shotgun-style home on West Fifth Avenue. Ten days later, on August 30th, a lynch mob stormed the county jail in search of an African-American former deputy sheriff named Maurice Mays, who'd been accused of murdering a 27-year-old white woman named Bertie Lindsay. Unable to find Maeves, the rioters looted the jail. They released the white inmates. Then they fought a pitched gun battle with the residents of a predominantly black neighborhood just blocks from my grandparents' home. I'm sure they could hear the shots firing outside their windows. The governor ordered the Tennessee National Guard to disperse the rioters, which they did by firing their machine guns indiscriminately. Seven people were killed, six black, one white, and scores were injured on that bloody Labor Day weekend. Knoxville's race riot was part of a nationwide epidemic of ugly civil unrest known as the Red Summer. Uh, from May to October, violent racial incidents swept cities across the United States, resulting in an estimated 600 deaths. The 1919 riot still remembered it's one of the worst episodes in local history, shattering Knoxville's image as a sleepy southern city with a reputation for tolerance. In spite of this, or maybe because of it, Roddy grew up in a home that rejected all forms of intolerance, especially the ignorance of racial hatred his code was to follow the golden rule, love everyone. The foundation of Robbie's values was faith in Christ. His moral compass was the Bible. Even back then, I'm proud to tell you, the Edmonds were committed to deep Christian faith, which Roddy fully embraced as a teenager. My grandfather, Thomas Calvin Edmonds, or T.C., and my grandmother, Janie Mary Sexton Edmonds, were born-again Methodists. Their relationship with God was practical, it was real, and sometimes raw, a singular devotion that affected every aspect of their lives. They didn't have many possessions, but they had what they believed mattered most, gratitude for life. 
respect for others, and an unwavering devotion to God. T.C. and Jenny live by the biblical instruction to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. They believe faith was as much caught as taught. T.C. was highly skilled as a wallpaper hanger who marked favorite verses like Revelation 22, 1 through 4 in his worn out Bible. He'd grown up singing in the gospel tradition known as the Old Harp Way, which is probably where my dad got his talent for singing. Old Harp singing schools flourished in Appalachia, especially in East Tennessee where students first learned how to sing the shapes, the scales of do, re, mi. Yeah, that. Then learn how to sing the words. Now, like my father, T.C., had a powerful voice, singing both baritone and tenor, and he was popular in the schools, singing events, which drew hundreds of attendees from all over the state. Tagging along with T.C. to these events, Roddy came to love singing in the old harp style. As far back as I can tell, the Edmonds family on both the paternal and maternal sides were known as God-fearing folk who believed that the righteous shall live by faith. Etched on many other tombstones, were scriptures that reflected their lives, like Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Or a simple statement of faith, asleep in Jesus. Saturday, June 24, 1922, was unusually hot in Knoxville. Keeping up with four active boys, between age two and a half and 16, while T.C. was out hanging wallpaper for Will Hoyt and Hayes Company, left the newly pregnant Jenny exhausted. Robert Seymour, David Leone, Thomas Carlyle, and little Roderick Waring were well-behaved boys, but oh, full of energy especially Ronnie. Had he lived, Richard, Eugene, T.C., and Jenny's first son would have been 17 and could have helped his, her care for his brothers, but Richard died suddenly at just two years old in August of 1904 from gastroenteritis. Wish I knew how to say that better. The tragedy of Richard's death lingered nearly 18 years later. Jenny and T.C. expected this summer to be brighter. What with a new baby on the way who could be a playmate for Ronnie? Jenny was petite and captivating. Her blue eyes sparkled under her red hair, which was full of curls and finger waves worn in the style of Zigfield Follies showgirl Gilda Gray. Though Jenny cherished being a mother, she decided that at age 39, this child would be her last. T.C.'s own mother, Mary, had encouraged Jenny to make Roddy her last, but Jenny wanted to try one more time, hoping the Lord would give her and T.C., a daughter, to round out the Edmonds clan. As he said, their evening prayers, and they tucked Ronnie into bed, T.C. and Jenny felt grateful, blessed, but Jenny also felt worn down. For the past few days, she'd been hoarse, 
Her throat was tight, which made swallowing difficult. That morning she had noticed her neck was badly swollen, and her cough, which had started as a minor annoyance, had grown more painful and frequent throughout the day. Her breathing had grown labored. At first the symptoms had seemed minor to Jenny, probably commonplace East Tennessee allergies or a summer cold. She didn't even mention anything to TC. But that night at 2.15, she died. Quickly and unexpectedly, tragically, alive one minute, gone the next, along with the unborn baby. Both they can do to the complications of a goiter, an enlargement of the thyroid gland caused by iodine, iodine deficiency. There was nothing TC or the physician could have done. The goiter had closed off her airway. Jenny had died from asphyxiation. She is buried on Wednesday, June 28, 1922, in Woodlawn Cemetery in her beloved South Knoxville, TC, who never remarried. He didn't record her death on the front of the back leaves of his pocket-sized Bible. And then he finally did, which he carried with him the rest of his life. Now, the death of Jenny left D.C. to raise the boys alone. The oldest, Robert, was a student at Knoxville High. He'd been happy to be out of class for the summer, though he missed the camaraderie of his fellow cadets on the Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps, J.R.O.T.C., Rifle Team which was one of the best in the entire South. Robert would later join the Navy and serve with distinction in World War II, posted to the huge Pearl Harbor Naval Station. David Leon, known as Rabbit for his quickness on the football field, was 15 when his mother died. Rabbit excelled in basketball and baseball, as well as football. Quarterback in the Boyd Junior High Tigers did the city championship against arch rivals Park City. He was a gifted musician, too. He could pick up virtually any instrument and play it by ear. And Later in the 30s and 40s, he traveled the country playing the clarinet saxophone and trumpet for band leaders like Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. Let me stop there and just simply say, obviously, this is a true story. His younger brother, Thomas Carlyle, age 13, was artistic and witty. He excelled at graphic arts and acting. As a young man working at the Tennessee Theater, he would pick up the nickname Shakespeare, or simply Shake. While cleaning the empty theater between shows, Shake liked to perform monologues, singing and dancing to entertain his co-workers. A decade later, Shake would open Edmund's display service, where he created hand-painted banners, displays, and marquees for local businesses, like the Tennessee Theater and Miller's Department Store. As the youngest, Ronnie was the most vulnerable, the one son most in need of maternal figure. I can't imagine what they must have been like for dad. Only three, when his mother died, he must have grieved terribly for her. 
But as the months and the years passed, Rodney learned to understand Jenny's death. Later he told me that he tried to live a life that would have made his mother proud. After Jenny died, TC's older sister, Sarah Edmonds Hickman, Aunt Sally stepped in to help raise Rodney. And right before he started school, Rodney moved in with Aunt Sally and her husband, William, a retired carpenter. Aunt Sally was heaven sent, Rodney would say later in life. The place on Petty Street, a dead end off the main thoroughfare of West Blount Avenue, was across the river from the University of Tennessee. If the wind was right, Ronnie could catch the smell of fresh bread coming from the Kearns Bakery just over the hill on Chapman Highway. Dad used to tell me he loved waking up to the smell of their breads, rolls, cakes, and cookies. On quiet fall afternoons, he later would often reminisce. One might hear the whistles and shouts from Shields Watkins Field as the Tennessee Volunteers football team practiced. The Vols, coached by General Robert R. Nyland, would soon be one of the best teams in the nation, and in the mid-1920s, the team loomed larger than life to Roddy. Roddy loved playing in the big field atop the hill at Fort Dickerson with his neighborhood friends. The fort had been built by the Union Army in 1863 across the Tennessee River from Knoxville to prevent Confederates from bombarding Knoxville and driving out the army. Roddy and his buddies played baseball and football or built little shacks on that same hillside. The homes on Petty Street were sturdy. They were made of brick and good lumber. Forward gables extended over the bungalows, wide front porches, which afforded uh, folks a quiet place to take in the neighborhood. Despite their modest dimensions, these front porches were perfect for spending time with family and friends, relaxing in a double swing or napping in a rocking chair. At the same time, the front yards offered Roddy and the other kids an ideal place to play tag and the concrete walkways to ride pedal cars or make a fast getaway on their bikes. The neighborhood, well, it was in a sense a broad extended family. Everyone seemed to look out for one another, even my dad who in 1926 was just a seven-year-old boy. In December of that year, he wrote a letter to Santa Claus that ended up in the evening edition of the Knoxville paper. I'm a little boy, seven years old. I go to school all I can, and I want you to bring me a car big enough to ride in. A blackboard, a derrick, lots of nuts of all kinds, and plenty of candy. Please, dear Santa, bring boots, something nice, too. He's a little sick boy who lives with us, and he needs an invalid's chair. Don't forget us. We're good little boys. I'm a little boy without a mother, and Boots is without a father. Roderick Edmonds, 702 Petty Street. In the first grade, Roddy brought home a handmade book of the alphabet, complete with a backward S for son, 
and pages that jump from U to Z, leaving out the letters B, W, X, and Y. He was proud and so was his family. Roddy would later master his ABCs and begin a lifelong love of word puzzles. He kept that little alphabet book in his dad's pocket-sized Bible as the only mementos from his childhood. I'd find them years later, tucked away long with his wartime diaries. Ruddy was a dedicated and conscientious student. He also volunteered for the safety patrol and helped serve students and parents. When he was 10, the Great Depression hit Knoxville particularly hard following the crash of the stock market in October 1929, Caldwell and Company, the largest bank in Tennessee, collapsed, triggering a financial crisis. It was hard for a skilled wallpaper hanger like T.C. to get work. Soup kitchens sprang up on Gay Street, and local charities were overwhelmed, trying to feed the hungry. Knoxville's growth virtually stopped as many folks returned to farming or left town. Much of the middle class in Knoxville ceased to exist. The city was forced to pay its employees in scrip and beg creditors to allow it to refinance its debt. Residents abandoned membership in service organizations, disconnected the telephone service, and went hungry. To make matters worse, the three long years of drought that had plagued the South made the dreadful lack of food even more acute. Really did. It was an awful time. As winter approached in 1932, there were reports that thousands of people were not only malnourished in Knoxville, but also starving. It was a tough lesson, but he learned it well, appreciating the little he had and how to survive the worst of circumstances, a practice he continued throughout his life. Dad knew how to make things last, like his cigars, a habit of survival he and his generation picked up during the Great Depression. He may not have had the best stuff as a kid, but along the way, he treasured the right stuff. In the presidential campaign of 1930, as Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt of New York offered the nation a New Deal, many Americans, especially in Appalachia, hungered for change. The hope that had almost ceased to glow now burns anew, one Tennessee voter wrote to Roosevelt after his victory. In May of 1933, President Roosevelt recognizing the crisis in the rural South, signed the Tennessee Valley Authority Act. Even by dire depression standards, Tennessee Valley was near economic destitution in 1933. Malaria was rampant. The average income was under $640 a year. Eroded and depleted soil had led to a collapse in crop yields and Tennessee's best timber had long ago been cut. As any school kid from Tennessee can tell you, the Tennessee Valley Authority was designed to tackle the region's economic woes and in the process modernize the region. It developed phosphate fertilizers, taught farmers ways to improve crop yields, 
reforested arid land and improved the marine habitat for fish and wildlife. The most dramatic change, however, was from TVA generated electricity. Electric lights, modern appliances, made life easier for people, including my family, and helped make farms more productive. At the same time, the TVA put thousands of unemployed men to work building dams and other projects. The electricity also drew dozens of new industries to the region, providing badly needed jobs. As one Depression era Tennessee farmer said, after his religious faith, the next greatest thing is to have electricity. After I started working for the TVA in college, Dad told me proudly that the TVA was a godsend. I gave, it gave us freedom from depression and despair. There's nothing better than freedom. By the fall of 1933, the fourth year of the Depression, Ronnie was an eighth grader traversing the halls of Boyd Junior High, the same hallways his brothers had walked a decade before. While many older students had to quit school to work or help on the family farm, Ronnie was able to stay enrolled. He was one of the lucky ones because in Ronnie's neighborhood, economic conditions would remain austere throughout the 30s. Although 2,500 jobless men and women in Knoxville had gone back to work by April 1933 as part of the National Recovery Administration, unemployment and hunger remained for many. No one believed the hard times would end. At Boyd, Ronnie excelled in English, science, math, civics, and art. Like his older brother Thomas, he had a keen eye and a steady hand for drawing shapes and characters. His favorite subject, however, was history. He discovered that the past was a powerful influence on the present and the only reliable predictor of future events. For the most part, Roddy's time in school was typical for that age. He went to school with the kids he grew up with, no more than a mile or so from their homes. He made good marks, generally stayed out of trouble, and participated in clubs and extracurricular activities. Roddy may not have had much in the way of material things, but he lived in a good home, sang in his church choir, and loved baseball. Just another seemingly average all-American boy. In that sense, Dad's school day experiences weren't that different from my own. But another life-altering moment for Dad occurred at church. As a young teenager in the pews of Vestal United Methodist, not far from his home, he became a follower of Jesus Christ. He described it as being saved, experiencing believer's peace, which he recorded in the back of his Bible, along with the four verses that helped him understand Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Till then, his sin, his selfishness, had been as natural as his breathing. 
but he had become unsettled, burdened by the weights of his sin. That's when he realized he couldn't fix his sin. Only God could. For him, God was real. The Bible was true, and he was responsible for loving God and others. He bowed and prayed, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins, and you rose from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life. Help me to do your will. In your name, amen. When he stood up, he was a different person. From that day forward, my father's life was transformed. Roddy would later say, I died to myself that day and Christ came alive in me. I was born again, born from above. In the fall of 1935, Roddy began the 10th grade, his first year at Knoxville High School. Like his older brother, Robert, Rodney joined the school's nationally recognized ROTC team with his fellow cadets. He took advantage of the school's firing range on the top floor, becoming proficient with firearms at a young age. During Rodney's senior year, more than 6,000 Knoxvilleans were still unemployed. The depression was relentless, but Roddy, like most, had learned how to survive. Every day, Roddy would walk alone to high school with a hard biscuit, many days in his ROTC uniform, crossing the Southern Railroad trestle over the Tennessee River, recalled one neighbor. Breathe the ball trip. A long, silent walk, nearly two and a half miles from his home in South Knoxville, past the University of Tennessee football stadium, through downtown to Knoxville High School on East Fifth Avenue. It was more than an hour walking each way with just that single hard biscuit for his lunch. Ruddy's high school years passed quickly. After graduating in June 1938, he got a job working as a stock clerk at Charles E. Hunter and Sons, the company where his father was a wallpaper hanger. He was lucky to find work because Knoxville didn't offer very much in terms of options not at the tail end of the depression. I'm sure dad wanted to carry his own weight and help out Aunt Sally. He also needed money to court his high school sweetheart, Marie Solomon, a girl from the neighborhood who was full of life. He had met her at Vestal Church and their fast friendship had quickly blossomed into romance most likely spurred by his faith and a desire to serve the country that he loved. Roddy enlisted in the United States Army in March 1941, continuing a long Edmonds tradition of military service. And while my grandfather, T.C., never actively served in the military, Nearly a year before Roddy's birth, he walked into the local draft board in Knoxville on September 12, 1918, and enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was 37, with a wife and three boys at home, but he was ready to do his duty for the nation. 
World War I ended two months later before he could serve. And Ronnie's older brother, my uncle Robert, enlisted in the Navy in 1933 at the age of 28 and would spend more than 20 years serving in the Naval Air Command, including during World War II. Nine months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, Ronnie was sent as a private to Fort Jackson, a sprawling infantry training base in South Carolina, some 300 miles from the only home he'd ever known. During his introduction process, he and other enlistees were handed a neatly typed introduction to military life. You are now on your way to the induction station where you will very shortly join the greatest team in the world. It read in part, whatever may have been your personal reasons for volunteering, the wearing of the uniform will make you a member of the best team of other men like yourself who seek to preserve the American way of life. Ronnie was 21 years old. Chapter 5 As the newly inducted Private Ronnie Edmonds passed through the gates of Fort Jackson, he no doubt felt a sense of pride, though when the base was named after fellow Tennessean Andrew Jackson. His good feeling didn't last. Uniformed soldiers heckled Ronnie, and the other new recruits with shouts of, You'll be sorry! Standing with other enlistees, Ronnie raised his right hand and swore that he would support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same according to the regulations and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. At the time of his enlistment, Ronnie was part of the massive ramp up in the U.S. Armed Forces. The military was changing at a lightning pace, modernizing from the horse reliant force of World War I and improving training techniques and battle tactics. New divisions were being created almost weekly as hundreds of thousands of new soldiers registered for service. When Roddy arrived at Fort Jackson, the base was completing a rapid expansion. It would eventually encompass 52,000 acres making it the country's largest facility for training the infantry. Following his swearing in, Roddy found himself standing in line, stark naked, as an assembly line of physicians examined every part of his body, which according to his admission papers stood five feet five inches and weighed a very slight 143 pounds, about 80 pounds lighter than the man I had known. A nervous recruit near Roddy asked the doctor if he thought he would pass the physical. Soldier, you're already in the army, the doctor replied. Dad, now Private Edmonds, was assigned to headquarters company of the 121st Regiment 30th Infantry Division. He'd be part of the Gray Bonnets, a hard-nosed infantry regiment of the Georgia National Guard, commanded by Captain Charles R. Irwin. The swift and crushing victories of Hitler and the German army across Europe threatened the security of the United States. 
President Franklin D. Roosevelt in Congress had ordered the Gray Bonnets of Georgia and all the National Guard into federal service on August 31, 1940. By the close of September, the regiment had joined up with the 30th Infantry Division at Fort Jackson. And by March of 1941, the division was well established and nicknamed the Old Hickory Division in honor of President Andrew Jackson. The Germans would later call it Roosevelt's SS for their toughness in the European theater of operations during 282 days of intense combat from June 1944 to April 1945. This company my father joined was one of the country's best. But he and the other green enlistees were far from battle ready. Dad and 26 other privates, most of whom hailed from Georgia, began a 13-week basic training program. Every morning at 0630 hours, Roddy added his voice to the chorus of young men as they responded to roll call. Every day was like the one before. Up early, trained for hours, breaking only for meals, then back to bed exhausted. For Roddy, the South Carolina heat and humidity were staggering. The pouring rain pelted the men's helmets and drenched their olive drab uniforms, which made their gear heavier than usual. Regardless of the weather, the men never stopped training. Even during afternoon thunderstorms or the occasional tornado, which would bring damaging winds, torrential downpours and hail the size of golf balls. Their sergeant reminded them that large hail pounding their bodies would be the least of their troubles in battle. Roddy and his buddies marched constantly, 32 miles, nine miles, two hour speed marches, two miles double time, endurance training that strengthened them for the tough days to come. Roddy competed against the other infantry privates in a hundred yard speed obstacle course, which had to be completed in full combat gear. The men jumped over a two foot hurdle, vaulted a four foot fence, ran a maze of posts and littles, climbed a seven foot wall, jumped a six foot wide ditch and crossed a high beam in other obstacle course. They rope climbed a 12 foot wall, then sprinted up a tilted ladder and across a log before jumping between a framework of planks. All this before swinging over a water filled ditch and monkey barring over another ditch, then crawling through a narrow tunnel and under a wire entanglement. Simply completing these brutal courses brought Roddy a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Many of the men referred to Fort Jackson as hell on earth, and to Roddy it was certainly the hottest and most grueling experience of his life. Still he endured it, pushing through the pain and physical exhaustion. Within a few weeks, he could feel himself getting stronger. The repetitive, uh, the, <laughs> the repetitive drills and calisthenics, coupled with the countless push-ups and pull-ups, slowly hardened his soft physique into a powerful lean muscle and sinew. 
he was becoming a proper soldier. Roddy's training also included intensive study in courses like army organization, military discipline, articles of war, hygiene, first aid, combat intelligence, weapons, mines and booby traps, and close combat. As part of his education and training, he was exposed to non-lethal agents like phenical chloride, tear gas, and taught to rapidly don his gas mask. He also learned to identify other lethal chemical weapons used during the First World War, like mustard gas. What Ronnie most feared, however, was the infiltration course. While machine guns fired over his head, he had to crawl 50 yards under barbed wire. One false move, one nervous raising in the head, and a soldier was dead, which tragically happened on more than one occasion. Every infantryman dreaded it. One guy finished the course with a 30 caliber hole in the mess kit fastened to the back of his pack. Though it was meant to stimulate battle, simulate battle, Roddy realized even as he navigated the barbed wire sharp points that as horrific as the course was, nothing could prepare him and the others for the brutal conditions they would face as soldiers in combat. And yet, that never stopped training. He quickly distinguished himself on the shooting range as a sharpshooter. His rifle skills honed during his hours of practice in the JROTC program, earned him the highest classification of rifle expert. He knew his rifle better than anything else. While he could handle all calibers of military firearms, his specialty was the M1 carbine, the lightweight 30 caliber semi-automatic rifle, which he could fire with deadly accuracy. At the same time, his skill with people and his calm, commanding demeanor one in the respect of both his fellow soldiers and his superiors. Dad was fast gaining a reputation as a natural born leader. What Ronnie and the other men were training for was never far from their minds. Though the United States was at peace, the war was raging in England in 10 days after Ronnie's arrival at Fort Jackson on March 31st, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sped into Fort Jackson at 0900 sharp on an unannounced visit in the Sunshine Special, his 30, 1939 Lincoln convertible to inspect the camp and watch the troops parade. Roosevelt's short visit inspired Roddy, though it wasn't the first time he'd been impressed by FDR. On September 2, 1940, six months before Roddy had enlisted, thousands of cheering admirers jammed flag-draped Gay Street to see FDR and Mrs. Roosevelt pass through the city on their way to dedicate the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Boy Scouts kept excited pedestrians off the Gay Street Bridge, while a few industrious kids hawked the stars and stripes. Everyone needs a flag, only five cents, Republicans and Democrats. Dad had joined the crowd 
as the presidential motorcade passed. Only hours before the president arrived in Knoxville, two Royal Navy destroyers had been sunk by Nazi U-boats in the North Sea, and the Luftwaffe had sent more than 200 bombers and fighters to pummel London and other English cities. During the dedication ceremony at Newfound Gap, a mile high on the Tennessee, North Carolina state line, President Roosevelt offered his dire warning. The greatest attack that has ever been launched against individual freedom is nearer the Americans than ever before. If we are to survive, we cannot be soft. Squirrel rifles are no longer adequate to defend the nation. We must prepare in a thousand ways. By the summer of 1941, the United States was waking up to a difficult national transition from peaceful neutrality to wartime readiness. U.S. military needed troops, equipment, and training. In June, Ruddy found himself back in his home state, where his Grey Bonnets Regiment and 77,000 Army troops invaded Middle Tennessee for maneuvers. These were the most massive war games in U.S. history. The first time tank, anti-tank, and air forces had participated in large-scale military training. From 1941 to 1944, Tennessee hosted more than 800,000 of the Army's finest for similar drills. Bivouacked at Camp Forest near Tullahoma, Roddy's unit took part in various field exercises as they awaited General George S. Patton's Second Armored Division, comprised of approximately 11,000 men and 2,000 vehicles. The Hell on Wheels Division headed north to Tennessee from Fort Benning, Georgia, in two columns spanning 60 miles from front to rear. Patton seemed to be on every hilltop and in every valley, leading, yelling, cursing, laughing. Like most everyone else, Roddy viewed Patton as a swashbuckling presence, a strutting commander who regularly brandished his pearl-handled 9-11 Colt 45 semi-automatic pistols, a sight to behold. Equally impressive were Roddy and the other young soldiers. Though food, water, fuel, heat, and hygiene were constant concerns, their poise and good-natured humor helped make these Tennessee maneuvers memorable. The boys were more than just U.S. soldiers in training. The citizens of Tennessee embraced them as their own with pride. The lack of rainfall made dust an enormous problem during moves and marches. When rain did arrive, it brought with it mud. But Roddy and the other boys made the best of it. They also put up with the lack of sleeping quarters. Several thousand soldiers slept wherever they could find space, parks, playgrounds, any place out of the path of jeeps, trucks, and tanks. In early June, the rigorous training began in earnest. Temperatures hit the upper 90s as Roddy and the other men 
practice specific simulations, marching in rapid fashion to gain better ground and surprise opposing troops, staging a counterattack against a larger opposing force, and retreating from a superior number of troops. One night in June, Roddy and the men of the 30th, 27th, and 5th Divisions moved out in darkness and rain to defend an approximately 22-mile line between Deason and Big Springs. Close quarters, marching at night in secrecy through rain and mud, was difficult and taught the men a valuable lesson. Weather was always a potential enemy. Toughened by the long, brutal marches in full gear and the stress of defending positions or advancing an attack, Roddy learned how to hide himself and his equipment from aerial observers, how to move with his unit quickly, how to conduct harassing rearguard activity. He also learned that the games were dangerous and deadly. In the first two and a half weeks of combat simulation, six soldiers died. The final death toll for the month, training would be 12. Still, the maneuvers helped Roddy grow beyond his high school, JROTC, and basic training experiences to more of a well-rounded soldier, one who had endured prolonged bouts of hunger, extreme thirst, constant fatigue, and the relentless stresses of war. During these exercises, ingenuity, to find provisions, to win the battle, and to summon the will to survive became the golden rule, the same as in real war. On June 25th, Secretary of War Henry L. Stinson arrived to observe the last part of the games. At 0500 on June 26, Stimson jumped into the seat of a Jeep and visited various locations. He was excited to watch two regular Army divisions, the 2nd Armored and 5th Infantry, take on two former National Guard divisions, the 27th and 30th Infantry divisions in the War Games. Like Stimson, nearly everyone in Middle Tennessee was awed by the sight of the War Games paratroopers gliding down in farm fields, thousands of infantrymen firing rifles and machine guns at one another. All well tanks rumbled, artillery pieces boomed, and aircraft soared overhead. The rank-and-file soldiers like Roddy took battlefield skills with them through these exercises. While the top leaders made strategic and tactical notes on the best and worst ways to lead men in combat, which helped them determine which commanders were adept at leadership, Roddy stood out among the enlisted men. Returning to Fort Jackson in July, Roddy made enormous strides earning rapid promotions from his commanding officers. By the end of October 1941, after only half a year as a private, Roddy was promoted to private first class. Nine months later, in July 1942, he was bumped up to technician fourth grade, radio operator, and by the end of August 1942, he was promoted to Staff Sergeant. Finally, on January 19, 1943, 
Ronnie was promoted to Master Sergeant and Communications Chief of his regimental company. Advancing from a raw recruit to Master Sergeant in only 22 months, a virtually unprecedented achievement. A position of that responsibility, the highest ranking NCO in a brigade, was typically filled with much older career army men. Today it may take 15 years for someone to make master sergeant, but Roddy achieved the rank by the age of 22. Congratulations, Roddy's commanding officer told him during his promotion ceremony. You're the youngest soldier to make master sergeant. The U.S. Army was adapting and improving rapidly too. The surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 had killed more than 2,400 Americans and roused a sleeping giant. Across the nation, young men, driven by outrage, anger, and love of country, rushed to enlist in the Army, Navy, and Marines. College students delayed their degrees. Recent grants left their jobs and their kids in high school too young to enlist, lied about their age at recruitment centers. Even veterans of the First World War and old men who had never served in the military were ready to go fight. Within days, the ranks of the military swelled by tens of thousands. Total strangers from every city and village, every holler and hillside, bonded as one for a singular purpose, to preserve freedom. Back in Knoxville, the day after the deadly attack, radio stations WROL and WNOX took out full-page newspaper ads promising 24-hour coverage. Sergeant Alvin C. York, recipient of the Medal of Honor during the First World War, born and raised in nearby Pall Mall, Tennessee, declared, we're going to give Japan a thorough licking as he left for Tullahoma on an undisclosed duty for the Army. Many families in East Tennessee clutched pictures and reread last letters from their loved ones killed in the attack. All of America grieved with them. <clears throat> After news of the attack on Pearl Harbor reached Knoxville, Roddy and his family waited anxiously. Roddy's older brother Robert was serving at the Pearl Harbor Naval Station. Finally, after days of prayer, the family received word that Robert had survived the assault. He would go on to serve with distinction during the rest of the war, fighting in the Pacific aboard the USS Sirius, shuttling supplies and Japanese prisoners through the dangerous waters of the Midway Islands. On December 11th, 1941, four days after the United States declaration of war against the Empire of Japan, Adolf Hitler backed up his Axis partner by declaring war against the United States. Later that day, the United States declared war on Nazi Germany. All told, 61 countries would join the global conflagration. The U.S. was now committed to battling fascism on two fronts, taking on the mighty military forces of both Japan and Germany. In mid-1942, seven months after Pearl Harbor, 
Prime Minister Winston Churchill secretly traveled by train from Washington, D.C., where he'd been reviewing war strategies with President Franklin Roosevelt to Fort Jackson, which was training more than 42,000 soldiers. Churchill's visit wasn't reported in the papers until June 28, after the Prime Minister had returned to England. Winston Churchill saw a spectacular display of America's expanding might Wednesday at the Army's largest infantry training post, where crack paratroops plummeted from the sky by the hundreds, and live ammunition from big field guns whistled directly over his head and burst near enough for him to feel the jar and the concussion, reported the state, the newspaper of Columbia, South Carolina. Chomping on one of his Romeo I Julieta cigars, Churchill inspected Fort Jackson's activities minutely, even prying into soldiers' packs, working the breech block of a 75 millimeter gun and getting covered with choking yellow dust, kicked up by thousands of feet and hundreds of armed forces, armed vehicles. He saw some of the plain essential drudgery of life in an army camp. Roddy and the other soldiers gained a new focus and a sense of their future allies from the charismatic visitor from England, while Churchill, weary from war, found renewed strength and optimism from the might of the U.S. infantry. Watching the thousands of recruits undergoing training, Churchill said, they're just like money in the bank. On September 30th, 1942, President Roosevelt made another surprise visit to the fort. He'd been on a secret tour of military installations by train, crisscrossing the country from Michigan to California to Texas to South Carolina and points in between. He visited 30 facilities in 11 states in only 14 days never venturing far from the tracks. The president traveled more than 8,500 miles by train and motorcade through 24 states under the cover of government secrecy to get a first-hand account of military production and citizen morale while the U.S. was in the throes of war in Europe and the Pacific. Along the way, Roosevelt saw impressive displays at the Chrysler tank plant in Detroit, at the First Inland Navy Training Center in Lake Pend, Oriel, Idaho, in Vancouver, Washington, at the Alcoa Aluminum Plant, at Camp Pendleton, United States Marine Corps Base in San Diego, at Higgins Industries Boatyard in New Orleans, and at Camp Shelby in Mississippi. And yesterday, the president told reporters, we turned up at Fort Jackson, just outside of Columbia, South Carolina, and reviewed another division, which was in a different stage of training from any that we had seen before. The commander in chief had been impressed by the preparedness of both citizens and soldiers, none more evident than the troops of Fort Jackson. And that's it, what a beautiful book. And that's what the service is like for all of you 
who are young enough to be considering whether you want to go into the military, that's the life of the military person. And it's a little different in the Navy, a little different, well, very different in the Marines, heavier and harder. And of course, the Air Force. And of course, now the Space Force. So, does it look good to you? Sound good to you? Something you want to do? God bless you if you do, but God bless you if you don't. I'll be back with no surrender in just a little while.